today my guests are Tony Corbell and Skip Cohen. I'm sure they have a few fun stories to share about their careers in the industry. So without further ado, please welcome Tony and Skip. Hey, John. Yay. Thank you, John. Yay. This all a started a, a few weeks ago. <laughs> we were talking about um, photographers and uh, Dean Collins' name came up. And both Tony and Skip said they had stories they wanted to tell about Dean. And then I asked them to come on here and tell lots of stories. So why don't you give a quick introduction, starting with Skip? Um, okay, <laughs> my my life on what I call the pro side of the industry started when I joined Hasselblad in '87, and then later on I did what I consider the greatest sell job in the history of this industry. I talked Tony into giving up his view of the ocean and Santa Barbara for a parking lot in New Jersey, <laughs> um, and that's really where it started in the in the friendship. In fact, let's just set the stage right now. Um, I came into Hasselblad in July of 87 and Hasselblad had already committed to Dean's tour. And it was our first meeting that summer. It was a, uh, it was PPA national in Orlando. It wasn't imaging USA then. And we all met, we were supposed to meet in the lobby of the hotel. Well, I'd spent the day by the pool and it's probably about, I don't know, I guess we're meeting around two. And I just went to the meeting and I had on, in fact, to go back to then, probably cutoffs and a, and a wife beater t-shirt and went to the meeting and I walked in and not knowing either one of them, they're both in suits. And I can promise all of you, you never saw, I don't think there's anybody here that ever saw Dean in a suit. He was so uncomfortable. In fact, the suit looked like he might have rented it because it didn't exactly fit right. And Tony told me years later that they didn't know what to expect. They were meeting some guy named Skip, who was now president of Hasselblad, who came out of Polaroid and was probably going to have Hasselblad and Kmart set on blue light specials. So that's where the friendship, that's where the friendship kicked off between me and Tony and Dean. And then over the years, Don Blair and Terry Daglo and so many other incredible people came in. So I'll shut up. There's my intro. <laughs> Thanks. So Tony, Santa Barbara, was that Brooks? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I had, I had started with a small studio in Texas and sold the studio and moved to San, Di uh, San Diego and worked with Dean Collins uh, and produced a series of books and videos called Fine Light and uh, got invited to go up to Brooks and teach uh, studio and location lighting classes. And uh while in San Diego is when I first met Skip. We, I was with Dean and we had this, as, as he mentioned, we had this tour that was already on, on the schedule and we already had Hasselblad and Broncolor, uh, Cenar cameras. We already had all the sponsors in place and Skip comes in to replace a guy who passed away. So we, all we know is we got to go have a meeting with this guy. To, we, so we go to Orlando and I said, Skip, this is an international company, the greatest camera manufacturer in the world. We got to, I mean, to, to Dean. Dean, I said, we got to look right. We got, we can't go into this meeting looking like a couple of Southern California knuckleheads and Reebok sneakers and torn jeans. We got to put on suits. And he's, and he fought me on it all day long. And I finally, I finally won and said, all right, we're getting up. We're putting on, so we put on these very ill-fitting suits and we walked into the meeting. Here comes Skip walking in with a wife beater shirt, you know, and sneakers. So we had a good, we had a good opening meeting. And uh, yeah, as he said, we we all just kind of hit it off. And we've been friends ever since. And uh, and then several years later, I had the chance to move to New Jersey and go to work with Skip. And uh, uh, we had eight, we had seven years together uh, in the great Garden State of New Jersey. I grew up in and, New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I I listen. It was New Jersey does get a bad rap. You know, I, it, I, I grew up in, well, I got old in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was fun. I, I really enjoyed my time there. And uh, yeah, I, it was uh, it was a good place to be for sure. So what are some of your favorite stories with Dean? Oh, do the, uh, I think the, from, I for me, oh, one, of, one of the best stories with, with Collins, we, Kodak, Eastman Kodak, uh, started sponsoring our video series fine light video and dean was on a lecture circuit then for kodak all over the world not, not just us we had done 50 some odd cities in the us and then we got asked to do all these international 
dates and cities. And uh, for those that don't know, Dean was just one of the greatest lecturers on the on the theory and concepts of light in the in the world that there's ever been. He was really he explained it well, and he was funny, and he was just the best. So so we're on this flight, and we're going to Oslo, Norway. And uh, as as we are just getting ready to take off, they had upgraded us to first class, which was great. And across the aisle comes in uh, Paul Simon, the singer, Paul mm -hmm. Simon, not the senator. Uh, so Paul Simon comes on the plane, and, and Dean just looks over me, and he goes, oh, great, Paul Simon's on the plane. And, and Paul Simon went, yeah, so that's a problem. And Dean went, well, hell yeah, because now if the plane goes down, it's going to say Paul Simon and 400 others are killed instead of Dean Collins and 400 others are killed. So I knew I had my hands on a knucklehead from that day forward. And uh, that was Dean. He was, uh, he was one funny, funny man, for sure. <laughs> well, we, Dean, we had some great moments. Dean came to New York, and I had not. I'd, I'd spoken publicly before, but never in front of a thousand people. And he did a program at the Beacons Theater. And I had Jerry Oster, who was the worldwide president of Hasselblad from Sweden there. Um, and I've got Dean and Dean suggested or Tony suggested that I introduce Dean. So I'd never been on a stage like that. I mean, I was in a musical in high school for, you know, 120 people and everybody's parents. That was it. And I get up into the Beacons Theater, which is a good sized theater and Dean and, and Tony and the rest of the team. That first tour, those were the biggest numbers that we had ever seen in any commercial program, let alone a wedding or portrait uh, workshop series. So Dean's got over a thousand people there and I get up to the mic and I completely freeze. And now I'd like to welcome, 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 welcome. And I'm just looking out in the audience. Um, from that point on, Dean always reminded me I was never allowed to introduce him again. I mean, that that was it. And the friendship from that point on, there's, there's just stuff. I mean, I used to go to his programs and I was happy if I understood 20%. And then by the time, you know, four or five years later, I was up to about 50, 60%. But I want Tony to do the story of uh, the, uh, was it Continental Airlines, the executives in the rotunda at with a Japanese guy <laughs> yeah. with a little point and shoot. Yeah, it was PSA Airlines. Uh, PSA Airlines, we shot their annual reports for several years. And uh, <clears throat> one year, th there was an old PSA terminal in San Francisco uh, that was a little bit away from the regular terminals. And it had only had about four, four or six gates. But it was a perfectly round gate area at the end of the terminal. And uh, there was an escalator going up. So we went and scouted that location to put the two, the, the president and CEO of PSA Airlines uh, coming up the escalator. And as they reached the top of the escalator, we were shooting, we were shooting four by five, uh, pretty wide, pretty wide angle lens. And, uh, and so it's the, the big rotunda ceiling can be seen in the shot. Well, we've got bronze color strobes, 4,000 watt seconds bronze color strobes everywhere. We've got two lighting the rotunda down one level below uh we've got two on the level that we're at lighting the other half of the rotunda we've got a 10 by 10 silk uh with four heads behind it lighting the executives so <laughs> so this this flight comes in uh and all these japanese guys come over to where we are and they're sitting there looking at this photo shoot you know thinking that these are famous people they're not but one of the guys pulls out a point and shoot camera and, uh, and he pops up his flash. Well, all these strobes right next to him are on a slave, right? So, so this poor guy, little, you know, short, shorter guy. And uh, he pulls up this camera and he's like, and he's kind of waving and getting everybody's attention. And he hits that shutter release and these strobes, they fire off like a shotgun when they go off. And, uh, and he was just like, whoa, <laughs> and, and he's looking at a camera, which, you know, of course, he had no idea what he'd just done. Uh, it was pretty funny. And uh, Dean, Dean said to him, oh, wrong ISO, <laughs> you know, uh, but it was a, it was just a great 
it was one of those funny great moments and yeah. nobody knew what happened except a handful of us you know going back well, to the beacon theater the size of it that's the first place i saw both kiss and queen back in the 70s it's a big it's a big theater it's yeah. cool that it's that it's still around but Dean used to drop things in since we're since we're staying on Dean for a little bit. Dean used to drop things into his program. I mean, I remember him giving everybody a lecture and saying, "Look, it wasn't stupid that you pulled the dark slide on that four by five holder to see if there was film in it. It was stupid that you tried to close it real fast." <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and people would sit there, and then there was the line of somebody, a, a heckler in the audience who said something to Dean about, yeah, it's easy for you. Look at all the beautiful models. Don't you ever photograph yeah. anybody ugly? And he said, sir, that's coming up. Why don't you come up here with your whole family? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He got away with that stuff all the time. We were in Chicago and one night and uh, he was showing a use of a panel. It was like six and a half feet by six and a half. And, uh, and this woman who had been asking really ridiculous questions all night long finally says, well, I just don't understand why that panel's square. Why is it square? And Dean goes, well, uh, I've, I've learned that if you cut all four lengths the same size. <laughs> well, anyway, he, 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 he made her feel really stupid about the question, about the fact that it was square because all the sides were equal. So, but like you said, he got away with it. He got away with it, you know. Now, my, <laughs> my, my most favorite story is, is definitely triple um, X or R rated. So you guys will have to use your imagination, but. I never understood why every time Dean saw Nick Vidros, he would just shake his head and go, Nicky, oh my. Nicky, Nicky. And I never understood it. And it was probably about two weeks before Dean passed away. And Nick was in LA and I was living in LA then working for Rangefinder WPPI and took the day off. And Nick and I drove down to San Diego to spend the afternoon with Dean. And sure enough, we walked in and, and Dean looks at him and goes, Nicky, Nicky, Nicky. And Tony, feel free to fill in any blanks. Oh, I, I was there. I know the whole story on this one. <laughs> okay. Well, do you want to go with it? Well, or I'll keep going. No, keep going and I'll, I'll right. jump in. Well, as the, as the story goes, Dean and Nick were on the road together and Nick drops Dean off at the airport and Dean forgets his little roller board. This is pre cell phones. He forgets his roller board in the, in Nick's trunk. He calls Nick later on and says, do me a favor, just ship it back to the office to Linda's attention. Nick goes to the adult bookstore L in town. L Linda, Ooh. Linda, who became Dean's wife and was just started dating, by the way. Right. So uh, he goes to the adult bookstore and he loads up the, the roller board with every nasty, with the worst magazines he can find, with brochures on everything from stds to aids and he packs it all in the top of the roller board and ships it back to linda now the other part of the story that that i never understood completely was the roller board came in and linda threw it into the conference room and dean is sitting there at lunch with a, a was it a product manager it was a client um, yeah it was, just, it was a client yeah. And they were talking about how he was going to set up a particular shoot. And he said, well, wait a minute. I got the Polaroids right here because I just did did one similar. He opens up the um, he opens up the roller board and every dirty magazine comes rolling out, cascading onto the table just as she's getting ready to take a, a bite of a sub sandwich. They and Dean, Dean and Nick at that point, and this was the best part of the story for me. The two of them were laughing so hard, there were tears rolling down their cheeks. And I, I almost felt like a fly on the wall of someplace I shouldn't have been. This was a private moment between the two of them of one of the all time greatest practical jokes. And it was just, a, it was wonderful. I mean, this was, like I said, this is a couple of weeks before he passed away. Now, what did I leave out? No, that only, only that, only that the line, you, you, you were right about the line where all Dean said was, oh, Nikki, Nikki, Nikki. And so for the next 20 years, every time anybody saw Vidros that knew the story would just say, oh, Nikki, Nikki. And everybody knew that it was the story of the dirty magazines, you know. We'll have to get Nick on here from his firehouse. He, well, he no sold firehouse the firehouse a few years firehouse. ago. Oh. Yep. yep, he did. It's gone. Okay. Yeah, but I, I was at got, that firehouse a few times. He got Pretty rid of place. the studio. Yeah, he did. 
and is yeah. like like so many artists today i mean he's he can go wherever his clients are he's, mm-hmm. he's but the friendship be, the friendship between those two was just it was remarkable you couldn't help but start I, laughing the we minute did you heard him start um, talking i don't know if skip i don't know if you were in the car or not but the first year i worked with, with skip or the second year we started a thing called hospitality university and uh and in fact uh, let me just show you something I brought in for Skip that he hasn't seen in a while. I have the world's only Hasselblad University letterman's jacket. Skip had this made for me in 1994. Remember that? Yeah, but I thought it disappeared. It? it did, and you bought me another one, but you didn't know it. <laughs> I used <laughs> oh, your credit card. Right. And <laughs> you paid for another one, but you didn't know you ordered it. <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so we got another one um so so we're in the car where we did the first series of cities was four cities and it was me and a wonderful woman up in new england named judy holmes uh and nick vidros and a guy named rudy gatash who was our digital technician at the time and great great guy great friend we are leaving boston so we did boston new york philadelphia and washington dc and the idea with Hasselblad University lecture series is we'd do four cities and then we'd go home for a month and then we'd book four more cities and go home for a month. So it, you know, it took a few years, uh, not a few months to get through the 20 cities or whatever. So we get in the first, we finish the first night in Boston, get up and, and we had rented Lincoln town cars for everybody. So here we are like the mafia going down the highway trying to get everybody from city one to city two, city two to city three, you know, that, that sort of thing. So Nick says, we got to stop at the 7-Eleven. So he goes in and buys National Enquirer, the Star Magazine. He buys every 25 cent rag newspaper in the world and, and proceeds to read them to us while we're on the road. And that was, and that was our entertainment was, whoa, boy born with elephant head. And he goes <laughs> and he reads the entire article to us while we're on the road so that was our entertainment that year so is that rudy i'll tell you if, Cannon now uh i don't think no he's rudy i can't remember rudy lives in chicago okay. um he was with um he was on. working really closely with illuminati, illuminati. light meters oh, okay. illuminati and, instruments. and before that um come on he'd ray from with, kodak with, i forgot with his name. he'd worked with Fovion yeah, Fovion. And he was over at Fovion. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Great guy. But yeah, so it's, it's funny how, uh, I don't know any working professional photographers who aren't just knuckleheads and, uh, Mike Newler doesn't even know it. I'm sure. Well, I'm sure he does know it, but, but, uh, one thing about Newler, we I always called him knucklehead Newler. And every time I was trying to reach him, somebody said, who are you looking for? I'm looking for knucklehead Newler. <laughs> I mean, cause he was as nutty as the rest of us were. But uh, I'll Ooh, tell you this. Me? This, yeah, I'll tell you. A lot of people don't know it, but a lot of people owe a debt of gratitude to Mike Newler for starting the Canon Explorers of Light program back in the late '90s. That was a that was an amazing program that to this day Early still continues. 90s. But it was, but it was Newler that it was in '93. Yeah. But it was Newler that started that thing. So thank you for what you did. You know, a lot of people were helped. You know. Oh, a lot of people and and so many influenced yeah so you want to you want to you want to switch to uh i don't know you want to go to don blair my well, i got a, we've got a great monty zucker there's <laughs> don blair don blair don blair okay lucy s for don blair hi skip okay, lucy. So, hi everybody yeah, can, hi, lucy. Can take... <laughs> hey lucy we can take requests here yes um but but my favorite Don Blair story, uh, when PPA Charities started, um, I was one of the knuckleheads on the committee to, to get goodies, and we got stuff. Terry Daglow was able to get us a uh, Arnold Palmer signed putter that somebody else had a Celtics basketball. I mean, we had so many different things in the package. Well, Don had a, if I remember right, uh, 14 triple E. 14 shoe triple size. E. Yeah. And I got Don to give me one of his shoes and went out and spent about $300 of Hasselblad's money on a walnut base that was just beautiful. 
and had it inscribed Don Blair's right foot, 14 triple E and the date. And that went up for auction. So it's the It looked like a bowling trophy. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) You know, it it did. It looked like a bowling trophy. Anyway, the the trophy goes up for auction. And Don Blair is sitting in the back of the room with a number of his nieces and my dad. And Don and dad were good friends. And and listening to the two of them talk, I I think World War II would have ended six months earlier if the two of them hadn't been in the Signal Corps in the Asia Pacific. And the stories between the two of them, Don is looking at, at my dad and says, now, Ralph, you watch and see how much this shoe goes for. I'm, I'm a big guy in this industry. And they're just, he's just laying on the BS. <laughs> well, the shoe goes up for auction and it's $100, $200, $300. There's some woman in the front row. She is so excited to get this shoe that she actually outbid herself and took it to a thousand. So it goes for a thousand and Don is ecstatic. And he looks at my dad and he says, now, Ralph, what did I tell you? And my dad is like humbled by this, <laughs> even though he knew it was all, it was all out of BS. So the next day, Don is just, I mean, he is in his glory. And that's around the time that Don and I had just released uh, Don Blair's Guide to Posing and Lighting Body Parts. And we had books that came in to WPPI, to the, I'm sorry, to PPA, to the show for the booth to sell. And Don's daughter, Kathy, needed Don's credit card. And dad was helping Don in the booth and said, do me a favor. You know, she went over and says, can you get me dad's credit card? I got a delivery at the front door I've got to pay for it. Well, it wasn't a delivery at the front door. The woman bidding on the shoe was Don's daughter, Kathy, and she used his card to pay for it. <laughs> so it was a thousand bucks that he donated to charity. For his own, sh- for his own <laughs> shoe. Get shoe back. For, his, for his own shoe, which, which his son, Gary, has sitting in the garage somewhere now. One of these days, I'd love to get it back and throw it on my own bookshelf here. <laughs> Um, and Don, I mean, my dad just did not let up on Don. Once he learned the story, that was it. He was going to rub his nose in it. So, I, hey, big daddy. So your shoe went for a thousand bucks, huh? <laughs> What'd you do to piss off your daughter? It was great. <laughs> well, that's fun. Well, yeah. it's fun there. You know, when you start going back and looking at stuff, we found recently, I'll share my screen in a second. I'll show a couple of old pictures, but, um, uh, one of the things is um, one year, Don Blair and Terry Deglo and myself decided we needed to go on a, to, on a little tour, and we were going to call it Don Blair and Friends. Skip, Skip came on board for Hasselblad and said, well, I'll sponsor you guys. I'll put you on the road. So, um, so we all got together, and um, where were we? We were in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, we had this picture – we had this picture taken. Let me glance over here real quick. I think it is in here. Hang on one second. I think, yeah, here it is. Is that is that showing up okay? Yes, that's showing yes. up there. That's- that was uh, that was me and the, Terry Daglow on the left, me uh, with, in my fat face period, with a lot of hair. The hair. Uh, and then Skip, and then Don Blair, of course, wearing his red cap. Uh, <laughs> he would never be without his red cap. So so we put this thing together. It was going to be called Don Blair and Friends. So to help promote it, we decided to uh, we were all going to Vegas for WPPI. And uh, Don was on a program. He had this big presentation to do. And uh, he decided we needed to trick everybody a little bit and try something just fun. So we get to, we all go, he, and he told us all to come in early. We're going to do a shoot that we're going to do twice. We're going to do it live during his presentation at WPPI. And, but, but he, unbeknownst to the audience, we're going to shoot it the day before. Well, we actually shot it a week before, but we, he wanted to show off at the, after the presentation, he wanted to show off a print out of this Kodak printer and how we could have an instant a five by seven print made right away. What he didn't tell anybody is a week before we shot this thing, had it sent out and we had to have five foot by seven foot print made a monster print that was seven feet tall vertical. 
And uh, so and it was hidden off to the stage. So during the presentation, everybody went outside. We shot this great looking couple fashion shoot on a motorcycle in front of the MGM. And, uh, and then we go back inside for the presentation. And, uh, and he says, well, take a look at this five by seven. We just did this. I think it's great that we have the ability to do this instantly. And he pulls this curtain off this five foot by seven foot print. And everybody's like, nobody could understand what they were seeing. They just didn't get it. But that's the kind of madness and fun we had. Actually, that was the time when Kodak and Hasselblad had a lot of money. <laughs> we could throw ideas at them like that. And they would say, oh, sure, that's a good idea. Let's do that. So. Well, there was a year, and this is, I, I joined Hasselblad in 87. I think it's around 83, 84, 85 that Marianne Semenko told me that she had a budget of $53 million to spend. I mean, that's, I mean, the amount of money that was out there then, and that's when Kodak was doing all those day in the life books. <laughs> but I, you just reminded me of a Don, Don Blair and Dean Collins story. So it's a crossover moment. So Don and Dean are standing next to each other at one of the PPA conventions. And Dean's got his medal on and it, he's got like two merit bars. And Don has his, which, which went all the way up bars all the way from the, from the very bottom, all the way up to the neck, to the point where we used to laugh about Don being hunched over. He'd never <laughs> stand up straight again if he kept wearing all of his merits. And somebody came over and said to Dean, how come he has all those bars and you don't have any? And Dean's answer was, well, you know, when you start out in the industry, you get all these bars and every time you do something right, they take one away. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. I mean, it, it left, it, it left Don Blair speechless and it was just, it became, it, it became a classic. Uh, but then one of my favorite Don stories when Don and I did the body parts book, it really started because Don had lost his wife, Donna, to uh, ALS. And somebody said, we got to find something to do to get him out of it. And why don't you guys do a book together? And I don't remember whose idea it was, but next thing you know, Don and I are doing a book. And we brought in our two best friends, the other two musketeers, Tony and Terry. And we shot it all on storyboards in a hotel room in Vegas. And we shot it in Vegas because at WPPI months later, I wanted to be able to use the same models we used in the book. So it comes time we're at WPPI, we're the opening convention program and Don is up there and I had lectured Don in the beginning because Don used to get up and he would thank everybody right back to his first grade teacher. And 15 minutes later, he was still thanking people for everything they had done in his life. And I said, don't do any of those this time. You're just going to step in and start teaching and we're going to go through the book. Well, we got to, uh, let's see, we got to hand posing and we had rehearsed this already. And this is also back in the days when WPPI, I don't remember the guy's name, but they had somebody that was doing uh, recording on video and we were hardwired into, into the videographer's system. Ugly George. No, it wasn't George. <laughs> Probably George. Yeah, it wasn't George. In any event, Don gets up there and we're going to do hand posing. And I had him, I was, I was so proud of him. He's sticking to the script. Well, I go to do hand posing and he switches over. I send him up his model and he switches over and you hear me say under the, I dropped the F-bomb that only the videographer heard. It's like, God damn, look at Blair. He's he's why isn't he doing hand posing well i sent him the wrong model i sent him the model from tall groom short bride and this poor woman only had seven fingers so i've sent him a woman with seven fingers losing him in a car accident or a lawnmower or something when she was a kid and for i sent posing. her up yeah i've sent her up for hand posing when <laughs> she was the model she was probably four foot ten and we had an algerian boxer that lived in Vegas, who must have been six three, was, six four, and it big. was a great series when Don did the tall groom, short bride, and how to pose them so you didn't have the groom all hunched over. <laughs> but I got to tell you, right up, uh, this is another one. Right up to a week before Don died, he reminded me he was never going to forgive me for that one. But yeah, he kept, here's he a copy of that moving also. along. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Body yep. parts. Wait, let me see that cover again, John. 
Let me look at that again. No, you got to share your screen again. Oh. So I got to talk in so good. Yes. So there's, yes. the, there's the back that's cover. Good. Yeah, we and can there's see the, it. There's the front cover. Yeah, that's it. That's good. Yeah, that's fun. That was, uh, I, I remember there was a, there was a woman that lived in Vegas who owned a modeling agency called Convention Ease. Now, I'm not sure what that means, but I remember Gaya. that was the name of the, Gaya. Gaya. That was it. Gaya owned this agency. And, uh, and we always got models from her every year for things that we did all over the Southwest. And she was really, I mean, she had all the Vegas models sewed up. And uh, she had this old spinster mom that followed her around and went everywhere she went. Well, this old mom had the hots for Don Blair. And everywhere we would go in Las Vegas, this girl and her mom would show up and the mom would scoot up next to Blair and hug on him and try to get him to go out. And it was just funny. It was a fun, it was a fun time. Those were the heydays of WPPI. Just God, we had so much fun those days. We didn't have any rules. We didn't have any, well, we didn't, we didn't need rules, but we didn't have any, um, there was not anybody telling us what not to do. We mm -hmm. just tried, th we just tried things. And they usually worked. You know? Yeah, so folks in the audience, if you have some questions or if you have some embarrassing stories about our friends here, feel free Wait to join in. Uh oh, I have a few. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, well, I have a Don Blair. For people that don't, don't know, Daddy Don, uh, I don't know, did he live to be a thousand and he was still teaching? Something like that. And so sweet. I was skiing in Salt Lake City where he lived and uh, it was a, a slushy day. So we decided to go get lunch and happened to see Don's studio across the street. So, and I'd never met him. I just had heard of him, knocked on his door and he gave me like a half a day lighting seminar. Just, you know, gave a tour and then, and I ended up, I think, buying a reflector from him. And yeah, he, he was awesome. But yeah, I'll, I'll, Oh. Let's see. I'll keep. I'll have to think about the Tony Skip embarrassing <laughs> stories. Okay. When Don's, There's no more. When Don's wife Donna passed away, um, I flew out for the funeral, and there was a line all the way around the block. I mean, oh, not yeah. only was Don loved, but Donna was part of the community. And after the funeral, we all went back to the church and and whatever the equivalent is of the Ladies Aid Society had made. Um, had made lunch for 300 people. And I just remember there were probably, oh, six or eight of us that were all from the photographic industry. And we're all sitting around Don together. And uh, one, some friend of his from the neighborhood walked by and Don yelled, hey, numb nuts. And we all looked and said, what? <laughs> <laughs> because we were all I mean, I still have a polo shirt that I was very I'm very proud of the fact that I got numb one. Um, I'm down, I've, I have the other one. I'm numb seven. All right. Uh, I mean, he would just what used to amaze me so much was the way he was so secure in all he wanted to do is just it was just shoot. That's all he wanted to do and teach, obviously. Well, but, and that yeah. rubbed off on how many people that we all know, you know, from right. Clay Blackmore to, oh my gosh, it goes on and on. I mean, that's what Don did. He, Don, Don was the photographer's photographer. He came across as a really funny guy, but he was a photographer for sure. You know? Absolutely. Well, he, I remember. He, oh, when Dean I, Collins. Somebody mentioned, William Morton mentioned Dean Collins. Mm -hmm. Have you already told stories about we, him. we did talk oh, we yeah, did we talk were... about dean a little bit okay we i got a story because i live in san diego i used to see bumper stick or yeah bumper stickers around downtown that said meter maids eat their young and years a few years later i did a week of west coast school in dean's downtown studio and discovered that dean had made those stickers because of parking violations and had put them all the way downtown meter maids eat their young so <laughs> you just someone just mentioned clay blackmore which reminded me that you said you had some monty stories monty. oh i got a yeah i got a monty story i got a we've all got you, monty you've stories. got I, i'm not sure if you can tell that one <laughs> 
Well, about I the letter, tell. about the email with the with the wrong signature on it. Oh, I was going to I was going to do that one, but I was also going to do the uh the 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 dinner. Oh, Joe just had a picture up. Um yeah, the Let's see. Let's let's go to the So this is Monty Zucker. Well, all right, it's very early. It's very early in the email world. And Monty for a lot of years um gave me credit for saving his career and his life, which I didn't do anything of the sort. But Monty went to a workshop um, and came back absolutely amazed with this new thing called electronic imaging. And he was just so excited about it. He turned around Ooh. and again, this is early email days, guys, back in the very beginning when all of us were excited because we got an email, never even bothering to look to see who it came from, just because you got something, it was exciting. And Monty went out and he sent an email to every executive in the industry, uh, president of Kodak, president of, of whoever was president of Minolta. Well, Sam Kuzumoto, I think, was the U.S. guy. Um, but Minolta, Olympus, Canon, everybody he could find. Um, and he sent it all out to him talking about how excited he was about all of this. And then he realized, and I caught him that night. I'm not sure why. I even caught up to him, but he was thoroughly depressed. His career was over. He was going to kill himself. Well, he had sent the email out under his alias on AOL, which was I suck toes. <laughs> I, got him on, I got him on the phone and I said, Monty, let, let's, I don't care who tells you that they never suck the toe. They're lying. That was it. I mean, he snapped out of it, but he was really, he was borderline oh, um, suicidal. And uh, oh, oh my God, my career is over. But my most favorite story with Monty, um, Monty had been diagnosed with cancer. He didn't know he didn't know what was going to happen. He'd already been through a couple of treatments and was feeling pretty good. And we did a dinner. I believe it was Shula Steakhouse in Miami. And Tony, were you there for that? I don't think you were. Uh, I I wasn't, but I was okay. I was around that week. All right, so we've got. We've got a room full of industry um, oh, executives. We got everybody, a whole bunch of friends. And we, we set it up as there were about 40 people there. We set it up as in the round. So we had one big giant square with Monty at the end, almost looking like a, like a scene out of The Last Supper. And Monty's up there. And the deal was that everybody could tell stories about Monty. And no holds barred. Any story you wanted to tell, you could tell. So Steve Sheenan kicked it off. And Steve talks about how when Monty first came out of the closet, it was a little hard to deal with. And they knew that he was serious when they all went skiing and they jumped in the hot tub. And he was sporting this, this sterling silver or gold bar through his nipple. And he'd gotten his first nipple ring. And the way Steve described it, he said, everybody was a little bit uncomfortable. He said, but Skip, why don't you tell your story? So Monty's looking at me going, what, what, what story does Skip have? Um, well, I said, Monty, I don't think you realize the influence you've been on so many of us in the industry. And, you know, being around you a lot and understanding your lifestyle and understanding all the guts it took to do what you did. I just have always admired you. And with that, I ripped open my shirt and I had a prosthetic nipple on with oh. a wood screw through oh. it. <laughs> well, oh, with that, no. with, with that, Monty cracks. But with that, 20 people, 20 guys get up and rip open their shirt. And we all had on, we had all glued on prosthetic nipples tony and i worked with with a woman whose husband at, uh, worked with a woman at hasselblad whose husband was a mask maker and did some masks latex latex masks for hollywood and one of his best-selling products was a was a was a glue-on nipple again with a rusty wood screw it was nasty looking <laughs> um well mel holson flipped his open. Mel didn't want to put his on, but he had it in his wallet and he flipped it open like, like a federal agent um, being part of the wood screw nipple patrol. But the best story was all the guys were told to get there early. Well, Rick Farrell got there early and I had gum Arabic for everybody. And I said, Rick, do you know what you're doing? Cause you just put, you just put a drop on the, 
on whatever you're going to glue to your body. You put a drop on there, a drop on you, and that's it. Well, Rick goes off to the men's room to put on his prosthetic nipple and wood screw, and he comes back saying, it won't stick. I said, what do you mean it won't stick? Well, he had really lathered up his chest with gum Arabic. I know that that night, um, his wife had to take him to the ER to have him surgically <laughs> removed his his two hundred dollar Tommy Bahama polo because <laughs> oh it was because he I said Rick no just a drop and with that he he pulled his shirt and his shirt didn't move it was oh, glued to his chest but I just remember at that moment Monty laughing with with just tears rolling down his cheek because it was just one of those classics Dave Metz was there at the time. I don't remember, Steve Troop from Buckeye, um, me, Sheenan, Clay was there. I don't remember who else, but it was one of those moments. And sadly, it was a couple months later when the industry lost Monty, but we sure didn't lose the legend. You know, I was assisting Monty at a at an early Texas school uh, and Clay was, was so I was sort of Monty's assistant and Clay was my assistant. And... Uh, at the end of that week, Monty said, that kid's, that kid's a hustler. I think I'm going to hire him. And he hired Clay that week. And Clay's career has, has just exploded for so many years now. And I just found uh, last night going through, thinking about what we were doing today, I want to show you a picture. Let me show you. Let me get this up. Here we go. So here's Clay and I in 1984 uh that, that's me in the members only jacket <laughs> with, a, with a lot of hair and a lot of beard but that's me and clay together uh and then here we are 37 years later hang on let me get to it wait where did it go there we are and that's that's 37 years difference between me and clay so <laughs> we've it's been it's been something it's been a lot of fun for sure. You both look great still. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, young photographers coming into the industry now, um, I'm not taking a shot at them because thank God they're coming into the industry, but there are so many people that don't realize the legacy that people like Monty and Don and Dean um, all left us in terms of never compromising on quality, always working with your clients, listening to your clients, um, I mean, it was one thing after another. Terry Daglow was in there and was a big, big part of it. And I mean, Tony and I, when Terry passed away, Tony and I had a long conversation about all the stories and all the things that that happened over the years. But then there were all the things behind the scenes that most people don't know in terms of their contribution to you know, how you, how you do a portrait the right way to lighting, to color, to things that Terry did at Kodak. I mean, Terry was sort of the conscience of, of Kodak when it came to dealing with, you know, a product that was too red, too green, where the, you know, they released a film that was, uh, that hadn't ripened yet. I mean, there were so many different. There was one year, there was one year, there was a lot of complaints because retouch artists, who were doing negative retouching couldn't get the dyes and pencils to stick to the emulsion and nobody could figure out what was going on. And, uh, and everybody, you know, on the manufacturer side of Kodak side, were saying, we don't know what you're talking about. Everything's fine here. And, and the retouchers of the world were going, it's not fine. There's a problem here. Terry is the guy that figured out that what had happened is uh, Eastman films who made motion picture film, had an extraordinarily excess run of emulsion batch that they need to do something with. So they took it back into Kodak Park, chopped it up, put it out as, as pro color and egg. Well, it was a completely different base and nobody could print with it very good and we couldn't retouch on it. And Terry figured out what it was and put a stop to it, you know? It was but no I do think, I think you're right. There was no tooling on it. it, it there was no, there was no tooth to it. Yeah. It wouldn't, yeah. it wouldn't hold anything, Yeah, you know, but Terry, Terry did so much for all of us and myself included. I mean, I've, I've been, I've been blessed to have a pretty good, uh, I've had a pretty good run. And uh, I was just looking at my background that, that big group shot that's back over in the corner was the UN picture that I did with Terry 
uh, in 2000. Is it, that's and, one uh, of my favorite stories. It's one of the best. It's just, it's just the thing that, you know, Skip has done so much for my life and my career, but, but Terry did it all. I mean, and Dean Collins, of course, uh, to, to talk about what Dean gave me and, and gave me this, my, my knowledge and my teaching base for the career has been pretty great. But uh, I'll tell you, uh, Terry, Terry did so much for me. After that shot and after I left Hasselblad, uh, I didn't have to look for work very hard. Work mm -hmm. found me because of that picture that it's 185 world leaders. And Terry brought in three of us to work on it with him. And uh, I'll never, I'll never be, I was, I could never thank him enough for what he See, gave I, us. Just so. a background on that. How did you light that? <laughs> with with a lot of lights with 19 umbrellas uh there were there were 19 in a semicircle, uh each what each with a large silver reflective umbrella and they were stacked up on you know just a standard six foot work table folding work tables mm -hmm. we had two of those stacked and then we had a, a 14 foot light stands on the top of each of those and at the, and that raised as high as it could go so we're up you know, 25, 30 feet. And then we were shooting on a scaffold from across the room about, um, we were probably a hundred feet away. Shooting wow. Hasselblad 80 millimeter normal lens. Uh -huh. You know, we shot, well, we shot three formats. We shot the Hasselblad. We shot four by five with a normal lens, a 90, I guess. And then we shot uh, on the uh, Kodak had just released the DCS 720, uh, 420. <laughs> So we shot like three frames on the digital uh, so we could get on the AP wire service within mm -hmm. 30 minutes. How many people so were supposed to be in that shot? 185. How many 185, actually were? 184. <laughs> 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 well, no, there was still 185 because North Korea left the meeting. They got mad, but we had an imposter in the room. So, so we still ended up with 185 people, <laughs> but uh, the one wasn't supposed to be there. So... This is a great, well, Terry, a great, great day for us. I don't know how many of you remember, but I, I bought Ansel Adams Cadillac as a fundraiser. <laughs> I was on the board of the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, and Ansel's widow, Virginia, had donated um, the Cadillac to help the, uh, the university raise money for the Visiting Scholar Fund. Well, the chairman of the board then bought it and came into the board meeting the next morning saying, my wife is going to kill me because she we don't need a 77 caddy. Um, will somebody want to buy it? Will somebody else buy it? And I decided that since it had zone five plates on it and Ansel and Victor Hasselblad were good friends, I'm going to buy it with Hasselblad's money. And then we turned around and sold it. But prior to selling it and the money when we sold it went back into charity. And prior to selling it, um, Terry and I had it at Photo West, which then PPE's sister show was out at Moscone in San Francisco. And after the show, Terry and I loaded up the Cadillac with probably $40,000 worth of Hasselblad gear and a, a ton of film and just spent three days driving around uh, Yosemite in Ansel's Cadillac. And a lot of people don't realize that the car had a uh, musical horn that Ansel had programmed. And, you know, if he knew that somebody went to uh, Wisconsin, then he played on Wisconsin when he went by. If he knew somebody was from the South and one of his friends had played Dixie. So we're going through the serenity of um, Yosemite. <laughs> we're playing the Play, car horn. Playing music. Back. Wait a minute, I can take this off my wall right here. <laughs> when I sold the Cadillac, I never said it would be sold complete with Ansel's license plate. So <laughs> I so kept, you kept it. <laughs> I kept the rear plate. There's me in Virginia. I kept the rear plate and his car keys um, <laughs> because it was oh my gosh, it was an adventure. I mean, there were so many things, and that that's the part that I think so many of us miss today, um, and especially now with the pandemic, um, there aren't enough adventures. I, I know. I remember this. I I was with you in New York when you decided to put that thing on the showroom floor at photo plus expo in new york and so we're on the back loading dock and the and the loading dock supervisor guy said you guys can't bring that cadillac in here with a with it's got half tank of gas you you got you can't bring it in here with more than a gallon of gas and so skip says well i got it he says 
he looked at me and he says, just back up over there by the fence and just leave it idling. And we'll just idle out all the gas. <laughs> you know how long it takes to idle out, you know, 20 gallons of gas yes. out of a Cadillac. So it's like, well, that, I mean, it's out there island for two hours and the needle hadn't moved. <laughs> so I put a brick on the accelerator thinking, well, if it's revved up, maybe it'll. <laughs> so we ended up driving that thing all over Manhattan, just trying to run the gas out of the car so we could pull it on the showroom and, and try to auction it off. <laughs> well, this, but there's another part of the story. Jerry Huckabee <laughs> and I took it into a body shop um, on the west side of New York. And I went in and said, well, somebody wanted to pull the tank. Well, if you pu actually pulled the tank and drained it, the whole car was going to fall apart. I mean, it was a 77 Cadillac. It was at least 20 years old at that point. And we had to get the gas out. So I said to one of the guys at the body shop, um, are you, if you want to siphon it off, the gas is yours. And the guy goes, oh yeah, man, come here. So he's got a cigarette in this hand. <laughs> he's got the hose in this hand. He starts to suck on the hose. He gets the gas in. He spits a little gas out, takes a puff of his cigarette. And I went over to him and I said, listen, I got to tell you, you are either the bravest person I've ever met or the dumbest ass on the planet. Oh my I mean, man. I said, you got a cigarette. <gasps> Whoa. He didn't even realize it. <laughs> he could have blown us all off along with the Cadillac. And we wound up selling it for 12 grand that went back to photographers and friends United Against AIDS. And then later on, it's Tony's toe. That, whoop, sorry, knock that print over. Tony's toe actually saved. Um, Rod Dresser donated. Uh, he returned all the camera gear that Ansel had had all those years. I um, forgot on loan from Hasselblad. And it came in one day. I later sold it to Don Imus for $100,000, again, all for charity. But I remember opening the case and dropping the 250 millimeter lens that we think was the lens that Half Dome was taken with. And Tony just kind of moved his foot into position and saved, and caught saved the, lens. the lens from crashing on the floor. Smashed my foot, but saved yeah. the lens. You see, Bobby Again, Lane was, joined us. Bobby, all, do you have any stories you want to tell about these guys? Hello, Bobby hey, Lane. Hey, Bobby Lane. Okay, stories. Uh oh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think there's any stories I can I can share in public here, but uh... not not many. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm late to the party here, guys. I had a couple of appointments this morning, but I'm happy to see you guys, and I'm I'm loving hearing the stories about <laughs> about <laughs> what you've been doing for charity. I think that that's a really important thing, especially in these times. We need to do whatever we can to give back. I you're Thank you're you. right. You're absolutely right. I love me some Bobby. And you are shooting better than ever. I just saw your your uh, beautiful reflections this morning. Oh, thanks. Beautiful pictures. Yeah, well I've done. been shooting a lot the last six weeks. Where do you start to see some of my musician stuff, Tony? I'll, uh, you'll, it'll be coming up. Fantastic. I've been doing some CD covers for my friends and a bunch of cool things. Fantastic. So coming up. Tony, I've been, I've been working with her trying to get her to stop cutting off heads. I think we got it right now. She's, <laughs> she's framing a lot better. and <laughs> Never I mean, going to happen. Lee, yeah, so <laughs> since Bobby's here, Bobby, Lee, and I are walking through the Atlanta Convention Center, and some woman spots Bobby and comes charging over 90 miles an hour like a stormtrooper. Oh, my God, you're Bobby Lane. I was in your program. I can't believe you're here. And with that, I looked at Lee, and I said, we're just chopped liver. We just, we just moved to the side. And then I saw that I bumped into the same woman as probably, I don't know, two, three months later at another conference. Oh, it would have been, it was imaging USA. And then later at WPPI and she wanted to come talk to me. And I looked at her and says, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're Bobby's girl. <laughs> I got to oh. say one thing about Bobby, one little story about Bobby. I'll throw on the floor. Uh -oh. uh, just, just a, just a, just a public thank you. Uh, a few years ago, I get a call from Bobby who said, hey, I'm supposed to be doing this workshop in Dubai, and uh, I can't go. Uh, something's popped up. It's a client job came in or something, but whatever it was, she couldn't go to Dubai. And she said, how would you like to go to Dubai and do this lighting workshop on my behalf? What is there anybody in this room right now that would say no to that? So I said, oh, I'm in. And so thanks to Bobby, I was uh, afforded a wonderful trip. Uh, a very first class week spent in Dubai. What a wonderful place. And uh, I can't, I can't thank you enough for that wonderful gift. 
Yeah, I'm happy to do trip. that, Tony. That was that was great. great. They loved you too. It was <laughs> great fun. It was great fun. So, Skip, let me ask a question because um, you, I think, you might have a, a unique perspective on this. Um, certainly, in the last decade or more, we've seen uh, a decreasing amount of uh, industry support um, for photographers and doing all of the things that you guys have been talking about. And, uh, and it's also, you know, goes to the charitable contribution ideas and those things. Uh, aside from going into COVID and that those problems, companies are making a lot of money. Where do you think that um, industry support has gone and why has it gone? Well, first of all, I don't know that it, there are, there's no question that they're, that they're still making money. But also, if you look at what happened, just, right just, back. You can go back. Let's go back before COVID. Um, the margins on everything had gone down. I mean, nobody made any money on Hasselblad, for example. They made money on the accessories. But retailers had to carry a minimal amount of inventory. We used to sell in a program called One to Show, One to Go. So in order to get your demo unit at a discount, you had to buy in one, another unit for inventory. Those were big bucks, and they weren't being turned over real fast. So a lot of the money, a lot of the margin has disappeared. Now, I'm not defending everybody's still making money because they're still making money. And one of the things that Tony and I tried to do at Hasselblad was I was irritated as hell that everybody in the industry was pretty much um, non-American. And Hasselblad was made in Sweden, and they were obviously making money on everything we bought from them. But I was determined to have us look like an American company. And that's where the charity ties in, tie-in came and, and other things that we did. Um, but the other thing that's happened, the industry hasn't always been that smart. For example, there was a time when every state had a state convention. Um, if For states to get back to that level, it's probably not going to happen. However, if several states got together again, and if you remember, we used to do, uh, what was it, Tony? Western states and... South was it southeastern or southwestern that used to take place in Dallas? Yeah, southeast, um, southwestern. Yeah, uh, Rocky Mountain. Um, I remember when Duncan McNabb was chairman a couple of years in a row there. Rocky Mountain would bring in. There were like three West, or four states western that states. participated. I think there were five regional groups. Yeah. Every state had a group, and then there were five different regionals. They were all five state groups. So. So part of what's happened also relates to the industry where everybody wants to keep doing or wanted to keep doing things the same way. The other thing that happened, and this, this happened while I was, God, I don't remember if I was at, I might've been a rangefinder then. Um, there was one year at Kodak, it's just before everybody remember APS, <laughs> that, that silly format. Yeah, Michael mm -hmm. does. You probably have a few scars because of it. <laughs> APS came out. There was one year where Kodak made one last ditch effort to try and sell APS film and get it out of their inventory. And the issue was they pulled money back from the pro side because they could get more revenue by selling into hundreds of thousands of consumers that had APS cameras there that might burn, you know, one or two rolls of film over that holiday season. So some of it is also how lucrative it's been. And I think for, for photographers to get support today, you've got to ask the, you've got to answer the question when somebody says, and, and Beth Myers used to ask me this all the time, because I would go in from Hasselblad looking for Kodak to participate. Maybe it was to give a brick of film with a particular lens that you bought or something with a camera. And Beth would ask me the same question every single time. How's this going to help me sell more product? And I just did a thing with Glenn Clark. In fact, there's a podcast out that we did on sponsorship where photographers who are looking and interested in sponsorship have got to do a little more fine tuning in terms of their skill set, what their message is, um, building relationships. So I think some of the money, um, Ian, has disappeared simply because photographers haven't done their homework. Margins, there's no question margins are down at the manufacturers. I mean, COVID-19, um, I do a lot of work with, with Tamron. And I know that, that Stacy probably went, I'm guessing, three or four months before they had anybody in the warehouse that could ship any product out. So 
that's hurt everybody this year. But I'm trying to look at it before um, before the pandemic. So for people that want sponsorship and support, you've got to be unique. You've got to be creative. You have to have done something other than score to 100 in print competition because that doesn't mean you can teach. And that's or support their it. product. Yeah, <clears throat> we yeah, we no. identified back in the 80s that uh, you know we we came to use a, a term called advertising through education, and so uh, yeah, I had a small little successful studio going on, but also that when I was on the road. Uh, doing seminars, lectures, workshops, whatever, uh, I had to do, I had to, I had to make sure I was doing my part and doing it right and doing it well, or Kodak wouldn't talk to me. Fuji wouldn't talk to me. Nobody's going to have anything to do with me. You know, if I wasn't out there teaching it well, I couldn't just be a name photographer. You mm -hmm. have to be a name photographer that's helping somebody, you know? I have, yeah. I have. Another thing with the COVID was the, excuse shipping. me, I'll be right back. I got somebody coming in the door. I'll be right okay. back. A, probably a process server. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quick. Talk about Tony. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. I, oh, um, my God. I want to bring something up that, that is absolutely disappeared from the entire landscape of uh, 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 the industry. You've got to have education in order to sell your product. And it's not even a question of which came first, the chicken or the egg. Education comes first, and then you can start selling products. The problem, uh, and I, I was a, a big part of it, and I, and, in hindsight, um, uh, I, uh, not that I regret having done it, but uh, in hindsight, it was um, not properly uh, uh, tuned. Um, the, all these cameras, all the lenses, any the strobes, the the, the 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 wink lights, whatever, they're just tools. They're tools in the hands of the artist, so to speak, the photographer. <clears throat> What's happened today is that camera manufacturers, lens manufacturers, are are desperately looking to sell boxes and they'll do it in any which way they can just to sell those boxes. The problem is that the education part of it has gone down the toilet. It really has taken a, um, a second or third tier from um, uh, what used to be. Um, and and dealing with, with, with what Skip said, um, if you have somebody that's uh, uh, an artist, does it really make that much of a difference if that artist goes out of his or her way to promote that product? The fact that if the, 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 the artist is there being sponsored by XYZ company, Shouldn't that be um, uh, a given to the people in the audience? You don't have to hold up the product and say, I use this. Well, what happens if you don't use it? One of the things in the contract that I, that I actually wrote for the Explorers of Light was that if Canon did not make a particular product or a lens that the photographer needed to, to do a shoot, they could use it. I just didn't want them promoting it. And well, that, that's gone. That, you know, Skip and I and Tony and a, and a, a couple of others, we come from an era that um, um, we were Hamish. We were, we were human beings and friendly. And we, we kidded around a lot. We kibitzed a lot. And that's what made the industry what it what it was back then. There's no kidding around today. There's no there's no fun. There's no um, there's no you know. Uh, um, we had a pulse. The what what? We had a pulse. We were alive. We, yeah, we had we're, a pulse. We were alive. We, were we had a pulse. We made mistakes, but we had 
fun doing what we were doing because think about it. Why did we all get into photography? It was not well, a hobby. Michael, you got into it because Matthew Brady said you should. He told <laughs> you to. I got into it because of that goddamn movie Blow Up. And I thought if I had a camera, I, I, I'm going to take pictures of all these wonderful women. <laughs> well, huh? I remember I remember Terry Shuckett beating me up because Tony did a presentation at Keeble and Shuckett and not once did Tony mention Hasselblad. And Terry called me and was furious because Tony hadn't mentioned Hasselblad. And my comment was, Terry, they know who we are. And if we can make them better artists, they'll buy Hasselblad when they can afford to. And at that point, I didn't care whether they were shooting. I mean, obviously we wanted them all in Hasselblad, but if you couldn't, if you were just getting started, then you were getting started, odds are in a Bronica, not you. necessarily Hasselblad. And when you got better and your skill set came up, then you had the money to keep buying more goods. But I don't know if I agree with you, Michael, that the, that the educational side is gone. I think right now, we're living in, a, in an age where I think everybody's starting to get on educational overdose only because everything is available online. And but there's so much wrong information. Well, right. Oh, now. Oh, now. <laughs> you see, wait, yeah, it's not that, there you go. That was hey, going to be my next line. It's not, it's not that we, it's not that we have a generation that's uninformed, but we have a generation that's misinformed. Well, that's right. a better way to put it. And, and, and here's the, here's the reality. Um, Everybody with a camera is an expert. Everybody. Skip, where are the Arnold Newmans today? Where are the Stieglitzes today? Where's, and, and there's only one Douglas Kirkland. There's only one Harry Benson. Where are, everybody wants their name in lights. You can't have your name in lights because who's your following? Where have but, you been the last 15, 20, 30, 40 years? But there uh, are, but that doesn't mean there aren't guys out there that are doing some creative things. JP Alario over in Albany is doing FaceTime portraits in COVID-19 and social distancing. He's got his client on one end with their phone on FaceTime, and he's manipulating the image on his end and telling them how to set up the lights. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's some creativity. Is it the same as what we appreciate with Arnold Newman? No, but when you look back on COVID-19, there are people that will stand out, I think. Stephen Goetz did, came up with an idea of taking portraits, throwing them into Photoshop, pull the color, turn them into line art, and send them out to your clients with young kids who are stuck at home as coloring book pages. Hold, hold on I mean, it's, it's brilliant. It's a, it, it's a little thing, but it's brilliant. And the news media picked up the J.P. Alario piece just to say, hey, here's somebody who's doing something. And J.P. has done like over 300 of these things now for headshots. Yeah, but wait a minute. But, you no. see, but, you, but yeah. you're talking about a one-on-one -on -one thing. The photographer is shooting a person and the image that's, that's created is, is really only for that person and, and their family. No, I'm Tell just talking about the application in terms of granted, being but it's still a one different. on one. <laughs> Ar a guy like Arnold Newman would go out and, and, and photograph a something, and that photograph today is worth a lot of money because it was Arnold Newman. Will this guy in Albany or wherever, Buffalo, wherever he is, will that image wind up in Sotheby's? Selling for twenty, thirty, fifty thousand. Well, it it might be if the newscaster that he did a portrait of. I mean, you can't. Is I can't look at it the same way, but I see the same love and passion. That oh, here's J.P. Alario in his thirties. I see the same love and passion of him trying to come up with a way to beat um, COVID nineteen. How do we get? How do we get through the pandemic? But that's that the part. That's the is, part that is. As far as I'm concerned, it's the same passion level as what you and I look at with our love for Arnold Newman. But is that a reason for a company to take this guy simply because of his passion and put him out there like the spokesman for the photo marketing industry? No. No, but, but, but he's one of Miller's icons. 
and he does a good job representing Miller's. I mean, it's well, okay. Things I are, think I, I think we're at a, I think yeah. we're at a time where first off, I don't think we've ever had a time where there have been more great photographers alive at the same time. Now, uh, there we we could argue that point, but I do think there are some amazing photographers still alive. Uh, some in this room right here, uh, Bob Coates and Bobby Lane, and, there, and the list goes on. Uh, but if, and somebody mentioned Gregory Heisler earlier. I don't think there's a photographer on the planet as as talented or as good as Heisler. And I and I and I've said that publicly for 25 or 30 stinking years. And Gregory's going to be um, a guest on the show in a couple of weeks. Greg Gregory is one of the finest <laughs> gentlemen and best talents, as is as is. Um, McNally and and the whole all of those guys there, there's a mm -hmm. and all the people that are on the team at Nikon and the people that are on the team at at Fuji I'm on I'm one of the Fuji team members now and the Canon explorers we've got a lot of talent but the difference is what we have right now is if you call their number most of them will answer the phone and most of them will talk to you in years past some of the giants wouldn't talk to you I couldn't I could never get a lot of those people on the phone but anybody that's a hero right now, they'll, they'll talk to you and they'll answer questions and they help new photographers. And, it, and I love that part more than anything. I see, I see so many, so many talented new people that pick up the phone and get on the, and, and make a phone call and get McNally to answer his phone call. He answers his own phone, you know? And, uh, and that's just, uh, it's just a, it's a community that we all know and love. It has changed. And Nuller's right about that. It has changed. Um, but it's, it's a community that still is thriving. We still love it. We are still making great pictures and uh, that's not going to go away because that passion is never going to go away. Everybody I've got, I've, I had to excuse myself to pick up a, an antique microphone for a prop for a shoot, you know, <laughs> oh, I mean, we're, we're, we're still doing what we do, you know? And there are, Michael, there, there are young photographers out there. I mean, Lindsay <laughs> Adler, um, Dixie Dixon. Um, there are definitely young photographers that are coming up through the ranks that are creating images that are astounding. I mean, Lindsay Adler at 15 had her own business. And you look at her now, how old is Lindsay? Anybody want to guess? 32, I think. 25, how old? 32, I believe. 32, okay. I was going to make it 27, 28. Sue Bryce. Uh, Sue Bryce. Sue Bryce. Sue Bryce is another hey, one. If you look at some Leon, of the... Leon Johnson is on this and... He's an upcoming fine art photographer. There you go. That if you look at his work, you'll be like, whoa. So <laughs> they're out there. Facebook is where you can find a lot of what's going on and a lot of those conversations and a lot of people who want to learn to be successful in business. Like it's, a, it's like a whole, Michael, if you're not hanging out in Facebook groups and having conversations, it, that's where a lot of action is where we used to do it at conventions. And I will say, y'all have talked about a lot of men, but there's also a whole network of women where we're hanging out, we're laughing. I'm in a, a group of 50 women in San Diego that have been uh, since the days when the, it was only guys teaching we started meeting 30 some years ago and we're still meeting. So it's out there, but it's in different places. So we're- can When I, I started, just, I when I started the Explorers of Light, the very first event that I put on ever to announce the Explorers of Light were <clears throat> Sheila Metzner, Barbara Bordnick, Joyce Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Moon. Sarah Moon. Good, Sarah thank Moon. you. <laughs> yeah, so I think Bobby yeah, has are, something she wanted to add. So, so these are names that you, you know and, and understand that they're not just the, the, the latest flesh on the planet. They've been right. around for a long but time. With any art, that's what happens. There's a million people. No, 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 I, and I agree with you. Except and then that the, the, to the top. That the companies that are promoting their team of greats don't understand that who are these people? Why are these people? And this is what they're promoting as being the wherewithal for that particular company. 
And that's what people are getting turned off by. I mean, mm. that's a fact. So can I, can I yes, Bobby. jump in here for yes. a second? Um, I think that, um, uh, you know, I'm on Facebook, uh, Lucy. So I'm, I do a lot of Facebook and, and I don't do a lot of Instagram. But I think that Instagram <clears throat> is really the place where there, people are getting so much following. Um, there's a tremendous amount yeah. of interactivity that comes on there. Mm -hmm. And I think that people are getting ideas. Um, Instagram is really extremely vital. Uh, and I think that that's very strong. And, and Michael, I, I agree with what you're saying, but also I think that, you know, we are definitely in a shift in time. I mean, it's, it's we're, maybe we won't have those great names that you said before, because maybe don't, maybe people don't have the patience for those names. However, that doesn't mean that there aren't a huge amount of, of talented people out there who have tens of thousands or, or millions of followers and, and they are doing a good job. Now, and I, I wanna disagree with you with one thing because I think that a lot of the companies, like, you know, I'm a Fuji X photographer um, and um, uh, uh, I see the companies now who have their brand ambassadors. Um, first off, they do want people to be able to teach because I think that that's, I'm gonna come back to that in a second, but they do want people to be able to teach. And they're also looking at how to expand and change. I mean, Fuji just went through a complete change in their ex photographers program and they're bringing in a creators program and they're looking to the future about how to keep everything vital instead of having the same one person who has been doing the same thing for 40 years and you know no offense to anybody on that but like new people who are coming in with fresh blood and fresh ideas so i think that there are a lot of companies that are paying attention to that in terms of trying to do like really good um bringing in really good educators as well as good photographers but uh, the other thing that I wanted to say, and, and this was a reference to Skip, and I promise I'll shut up after this, um, is that um, um, there is a huge amount of information out there right now. I mean, it's just like everybody who's ever taken a picture or had even a tiny little business has jumped on the bag bandwagon about doing education. And, and I think we're probably most of us who are you know, seasoned educators agree that an awful lot of it is really not very good. Um, and it isn't even so much that it's misinformation, it's just not very good information, or it's not presented in a way that people can really understand so that they would get excited and, and, and inspired. So it's awfully hard to get through that whole mass of all of these people who are yelling at you. And some of these people are brilliant marketers, and maybe they have money behind them so that they have beautifully produced videos and all this other stuff, but it still doesn't mean that they're a good educator along oh, and, you have to be and, a good photographer I, and I'm, some I'm of them, and bobby and bobby you and i know a lot of these people and some of them are really brilliant photographers they have no business standing on a stage or trying mm -hmm. to teach anybody anything yeah, sure i see a lot of people brilliant that, photographers they, they take right. a great photo but when they tell you how they did it it's like no you didn't do that <laughs> yeah, john, john to... probably <laughs> cornicello Cornicello probably is in a better position to make that statement than anybody in this world. He has worked with everyone that has ever been on Creative Life. Mm -hmm. He has he has assisted or worked or shot with them or helped them, and uh, and he knows who's who and who's doing what, and what they're saying, what they're teaching, how they're doing it. And, uh, it goes you know, back it, further it, though. It seems like somewhere in the '70s, editors started chopping things out of books. You know, they they give you half of of an a line of information and cut off the rest and tech editing is just gone you know i keep reading books that that are almost there but the tech editing you know they're just wrong terminology and things like that and it just gets frustrating so yeah. tony i have to say that the worst west coast school class i ever took was arnold newman yeah he's not a teacher he's, a, he's not a teacher fabulous guy but it wasn't mm -hmm. it was yeah. fun yeah. but it was frustrating because I was there to learn. And now I did end up with him looking at my final portfolio and saying, Lucy, you have whatever it takes, you have what it takes to do whatever you want to with your photography. So that was worth the week. Did you, um, learn, did you learn anything from Arnold? No. Nothing. No. Well, I didn't learn anything from Arnold. Okay. I learned, I'm just saying in terms of solid education i i enjoyed his stories um yes absolutely when we did a session at a house 
and he set up a sheet and one light and he took 25 minutes for one pose with his big old camera that someone else had to focus because he was older and he got the most magnificent image with that one shot absolutely so yes it was I, w- I walked into his studio once and it was a religious experience walking into his studio yeah yeah i'm it not was really him something at all i'm just saying what you said is some people are teachers that may sure. not be fine artists and some people are fine artists that you learn by being around them how do you define a fine artist What's a fine artist? How do I define? Oh, that's a that's a whole conversation, isn't it? <laughs> is, no, but is, can't you can't you, <laughs> can't you can't you consolidate it? What's a fine artist? Yes, that there is probably no answer to that. Or that's a whole. What I'm saying that's, is that's he, another show. Yeah, but he someone that goes into the the legacy. You know, there are great photography teachers who are not doing work that would stand the test of time, who don't use, you know, they're great teachers. And, but, you know, they may not know composition or, you know, I don't know. That's a whole other conversation. We'll have that another day. Good question. How do you (laughs) define fine art or art? It was Helmut Newton that said, I'm not an artist, I'm a photographer. <laughs> Look, there's no, there's no question that the industry has changed. You could say that. And the, but the mm-hmm. internet is, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, Arnold Newman stood out since you brought up Newman. Uh, well, I have to laugh because Newman could never remember my name. Uh, I always had to be reintroduced to Arnold. Arnold. It was you, um, it was probably a hearing issue though. Yeah. He, he couldn't well, that hear. That could be too. That could be too. <laughs> but but Arnold stood out, and so many of those greats that we all look back on and admire stood out simply because they stood out and they made their voice heard. Right. If you look at today, there are so many. I mean, one little knucklehead in the middle of Iowa somewhere if they do it right, has the ability to influence thousands of people if they know what they're doing on the internet. And that's, and that's part of the challenge. I mean, it's, it doesn't change when, when Ian asked the question before about sponsorship and, and where's that money gone. Um, there's still money out there. There's still support out there. And there's still a lot of young artists that do have that, that, have that passion. Are they gonna become an Arnold Newman? I don't know. Competition is more fierce than it's ever been. The number of images that we can all look at in in one hour on Facebook is unbelievable. And the number of images that we'll look at and we'll go, wow, you know, how did he or she do that? I mean, I've got an image that I shared a while back of Deb Sandage, um, who's a spokesperson for Nikon. And I can't remember how long an exposure it was. And it's just stunning. And, and, and Deb is, is well-known. Will she be another Arnold Newman? I don't know, but she's got the passion for it. And it's the uh, same. I mean, if you look at some of Bobby's work, since, when, since Lucy before said, well, you know, there aren't an, we're, not, we're talking all about men. We're talking about men because Tony and I were in this industry together at a time when it was mostly men, but I'll bet you if I think hard enough, I could come up with a couple of great Helen Yancey stories too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like the time we short sheeted her bed and she and Foster couldn't figure out what was going on in their room. Um, <laughs> Cause there are a lot, it, it, Scott Bourne said it a long time ago that photography, photography is the great equalizer. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how much money you have, what sex, what you've been doing with your life. You're going to be judged on the quality of that image. Okay. It's it's almost like the the voice before the voice Zoom came along. But you're but you're also competing against everything. There we're on yeah. track to do 1.6 trillion images this year will be made. 1.6 trillion. It's yeah. I mean that's just and, in the and and as a as a as a pro. I remember hearing, um, I've, I've taught at Santa Fe workshops for 16 years. 
And uh, I remember sitting down with Jay Mazel when Jay one night said, uh, at the end of the day, when the smoke clears, no matter how much money you made on that picture, no matter how much, what minute, what kind of awards you won, the accolades you received, the, the praise, if it got published in the, ma in the magazine or whatever, you're the only one in the world that night when you lay down in your bed, you're the only one that knows what you missed or what you did wrong. And you got to know that. And you've got to know that when, when it comes time to pull the trigger, you can't miss anything. That quality has to permeate every single ounce of what it is that you're doing. You can't take a shortcut. Oh, I should move that light another three inches to the left. That's fine. Click. You'll, you'll hate yourself when you go to bed tonight. You're the only one that knows you didn't move it three inches and you probably should have, you know? So but if that came from Jay, I'm sure there's a few F-bombs mixed in there. Oh, there was <laughs> F-bombs. I, I edited. <laughs> you know, the, My... the one thing that has changed over time is that when, when the photography was eight by 10 and I had to load those eight by 10 film holders and do it one at a time, all right, um, you had to be very careful about how you set things up, where you plop things down, and you shot. Then we got into medium, uh, medium format and roll film, and you could knock off uh, uh, what? Uh, uh, 10, 12. Uh, one, 120 or 220, I forget how many frames there were, mm -hmm. all right? But you could just keep knocking it off. Then we got into 35 millimeter and we got into 35 millimeter with 250 exposure backs. Now we're into digital. Do you really think that, that the average photographer or somebody that wants to be a photographer really cares about how many frames they're shooting because the law of averages says that they're going to get possibly one out of I don't know, 300 shots that they like. So consequently, when we talk about how many images, how many trillions of images are made today, how many of them are good? That's the question. <laughs> I mean, can you, can, you, can, you, can, you picture somebody, can you picture can you picture people loading eight by ten film to <laughs> come up with a trillion images? No. Well, and then to find good. Well, what? define good. I, I'm meeting with a client tomorrow that I did a portrait 25 years ago that she said, and she wants them to, I do have the negatives and uh, she wants some new pictures from it. She said it was the best investment she's ever made in her life. And I'm sure I'm going to cringe a little <laughs> when I see these images. When you from, say <laughs> When I see them from 25 years ago when I was just switching from weddings to in-studio portraits. So what's, you know, I can tell relativity. you what's, you, you know how to define good? If you as the photographer slash artist, image maker, feel that what you've done is good, then it's good. Okay. That's it. Well, that's, that's one way. The other way is Dean's old line of beauty is in the eyes of the checkbook holder. That's, exactly, right. that's another yes. way. And, that's exactly and if, right. you look, if you see off my, off my shoulder in the back there, you see three prints on the wall. Mm -hmm. The top one is me and my dad. I love that shot. It's black and white. Bambi Cantrell did it. The one underneath it, Vanelli did of me and, and Molly the Wonder Dog before she died. And the one on the right is a stunning French horn shot because my dad and I were into music. And it's one of Bob's images, as in Bob Coates. Mm -hmm. I mean, to define fine art, which you asked before and Lucy couldn't answer it. It's something that's in your heart. What I see as fine art won't be the same as what you see as fine art. I mean, I, I got caught sponsoring a fine art. Oh, what do you want to call it? Competition. When I was in Hasselblad, the helmet horn got us into and the winning image was a student who took a picture of rotting fruit in the refrigerator, trying to make a statement. And I'm looking at it and going, no, that's bad photojournalism. We all see something different. The issue is when you're looking at an image, what's the sound? Of, you know, it's that like that 
air sucking sound that photographers make when you see an image that's stunning and you're going that's the sound that that's either fine art or high impact or you're sitting there and you're saying wow this is a photographer that captured that that moment that yeah. that you want to see and that's the that's how you well, define fine art and and i i'm gonna have to jump off here in a second but i, yeah, I want to make sure too because i know skip had I, another meeting yeah. that's why we started I, early i wanted to mention that um the the difference between fine art for me uh like let's let's say let's say nudes and and pornography what's the difference between nudes and pornography lighting so <laughs> maybe that's a little something for, that's something for me and bobby so <laughs> it's all about the light the impress of light yeah so i know both of our guests have to go in a few seconds so we'll get some last words from them but i'm happy to stay on for a while and keep conversation going if people want to so skip you well, have some final word for today i guess the only, the only thing i'd say is that it's up to all of us here and i most a lot of you i know and have known for years i love the fact that norma grief by the way that that spot underneath newler on my screen norma's <laughs> in the uk and i've never met norma but we've talked a hundred times in ims on facebook and she's doing some very cool things but my point is the world has gotten very small and it's up to all of us to try and help photographers stay focused. The pandemic has created a, it's a nightmare for everybody, but it doesn't mean that hunkering down means hunkering down from your business. Hunkering down is about your health. It's not about, as Bob said, physical distancing, not social distancing, but physical distancing. Uh, and that's hunkering down. It's not about your business. It's not about walking away from looking at new ideas. It's not about following the icons and people like, like, well, Bobby and Tony, for example, and Bob, who are out there all the time sharing stuff. And John, your, your podcast. Um, we are an industry of, as far as I'm concerned, and I've been accused of being the industry cheerleader for years. Um, I, you guys are magicians. I love the marketing business side of it. I'm not a professional photographer. I know more than I let on, but the difference is it would take me 10 hours to light a portrait that Tony would do in 10 minutes. <laughs> but if we can help photographers stay focused um, and stay, I don't mean the pun, stay focused and stay active and realize that relationship building isn't disappearing just because of the pandemic. I think that's where our responsibility comes in. And that's the legacy that to me, people like Don and Monty and Dean um, all loved. And if they were all alive today, you can be damn sure that every one of them would be doing something unique that nobody had ever thought of before. Thank you. You know, one of the things I'll just wrap up also by saying that one of the things uh, I admire so much about so many people in it and Skip and I've had a great friendship for 32 or 33 years now. And uh, one of the things I admire about Skip in this world, in our industry specifically, at Don Blair's funeral, which I was in the middle of a workshop in Napa, and I had to it, – it's ridiculous trying to get over there, trying to get this – get do the cemetery, do the funeral, then go back to – get on a plane and get back to a workshop, and it was just nuts. But the thing that, that hit me the hardest about that day was the Skip's closing comments to Don Blair's grandchildren. Uh, Don had, I don't remember how many grand chicks. He called them his chicks, uh, uh, his little chicks. And uh, I think he probably had 12 or 14 of them at this, in the front two rows of this church at, the, at Don's funeral. And Skip said, uh, and it made me, it just warmed my heart because I had talked to Don the day before he died. But Skip said to the grandkids, he said, I'm talking to you now specifically. Anytime you are in any city in the world, anywhere in the world, and you have a problem and you need help and you don't know what to do and you don't know who to call, find a photographer and tell them you're Don Blair's grandson or granddaughter and somebody will find help for you. Whatever you need, if it's money, a place to stay, a car, police help, whatever you need because everyone in the world will come to Don's rescue for you. And I thought that's what this community is all about. Absolutely. You know, all of us have met people and that we are, uh, we are 
committed to being friends with. Uh, we know each other. We know each other well enough to know. I know, Lucy, I'm coming back to San Diego again uh, in the next few months. I know I can pick up the phone and call Lucy and say, Lucy, I got a problem. Lucy will send me equipment. She will send me models. She'll send me helpers. One phone call. I got help any city in the world. It's not because of who I am. It's because of what this industry does for all of us. Yes. And, uh, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's overwhelming sometimes. So Good. anyway, John, thank you for what you're doing. You have added another wrinkle to this too. So sure. thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for stuff, you John. Yeah. Well, I'm going to shut down Facebook now and thank you all for coming there and stop that live stream and, and everybody stay safe stay healthy and remember a mask is not a political statement it's an iq test it also <laughs> is a statement of love that's what i heard somebody say is a mask is saying i love you to whoever you encounter because it's protecting mm -hmm. them not yeah. us According it is funny though to see people science. walking into a bank with a mask on yeah <laughs> that's something that didn't happen before <laughs> Hey, everybody. Stay Love safe and healthy. John, thanks so much for this. Sure. sure. Thank you. Thank you. It's awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Glad to see everybody. Thank you. Take care. You. Thank Thank you. Take care. Michael, God bless you, Michael Newler. Love you all. all right, thank Be you. well. Bobby. Okay, namaste. Be a good boy, Skip. <laughs> namaste. <night. laughs>